This is the one I've been waiting for ever since it was announced at CES last year and it has absolutely ruined my experience when using any other monitor. And as someone who has personally bought and used daily every single version of the 49 inch G9 screen and screens like the ridiculously big 55 inch Samsung Arc, the monstrous 57 inch Samsung G9 Neo is pretty much the end game when it comes to the world's best monitor for gaming, for productivity, for everything. Or is it? So the unboxing experience is a pretty fun one. The box is ginormous. I definitely recommend two people for this one. Although the process is pretty straightforward as long as you open the box up the right way and start. In the box, you get the white blanking panel to cover up the wires, the stand, of course, with the feet, cables for power, display, and USB, though the display port cable they include is so short it doesn't even reach the other side of the screen, which might be fun. And you also get the visa mount and plastic cover for the back of the screen. It's definitely possible to unbox this yourself. You can attach the stand whilst it's in the box and then you lift it out using the stand onto your desk, but it is pretty heavy. So let's cover off the specs because this is a monster. It is a 57 inch mini LED panel with 2,392 local dimming zones. And that hits a resolution of 7,680 by 2160, which means it is the world's first dual UHD monitor that can actually display two 4K pictures side by side. Now other features are a 240 Hertz refresh rate with a one millisecond response time along with HDR 1000 and FreeSync Premium Pro. So it is killer for gaming and it's predominantly marketed as a gaming monitor. But as you'll see in a minute, it is way more than just a gaming monitor. Now this screen also sees the return of the 1000R curve, which I'm a huge fan of. As that curve just wraps around you instead of screens that have a, like a less pronounced curve, like on an 1800R curve, where at least on the most recent 49 inch G9 OLED, you just find yourself like leaning over slightly to see the edges. Now, of course, the size of this thing does mean you have to move your head a fair bit to see everything unless you sit yourself a fair bit away from the screen. So for reference, I have the screen sat on quite a shallow desk right here that's just over two feet deep. And I find the screen and that curve just really comfortable to use for extended periods of time. I'm also hugely impressed with the screen's ability to prevent, well, any reflections. Now I've got a huge window on one side of me. And even if I switch on my studio lights, which are directly behind my screen, I can't see any reflections whatsoever. It's actually pretty incredible, like some kind of black magic. So the matte coating they are using on this screen obviously does a great job. And I have no concerns over using this in like challenging environments where you have a bright light source, like a, a big window or bright lights around you. The design also hasn't changed pretty much at all from the previous generation screens. You still get the glossy white finish on the back that you'll likely never see again once you set the screen up. If you're like most people who just back their desk up on their screens, kind of like I do here. Though if you do have it on show, it does look quite nice. It's very clean. I like all the detail you get on the back as well. It looks very very gamery and futuristic if that's what you're into. The center ring at the back also lights up with Samsung's core lighting system, which features on all the previous generation screens. It is much larger than the previous generations, mostly because the screen itself is, well, of course, just larger. But disappointingly, it is still no brighter, which when you're targeting a gaming market who love to you know, pimp their setups with multiple color LEDs, well, Samsung's core lighting is just a bit pointless because even with the screen up against the wall, you can barely tell the difference when it's on or off. It's on right now. Can you tell the difference? Now, the stand also hasn't changed much at all. It is height adjustable, it pivots. There's also a loop included at the back for cable management, but the feet, the feet, holy cow, the feet, they are ginormous. Now, which they need to be, of course, for a screen that weighs this much. The sheer size and weight of this thing means that you need a substantial stand to carry the weight. Now, the only problem is that the design of these feet mean they take up a huge amount of desk space and then your ability to put anything under or near the screen, even something as simple as a, like a simple desk mat becomes really, really tricky. Now, it is no different than all of the other G9 screens other than the latest G9 OLED, which has a new design due to the screen being just much lighter. But I've always preferred mounting my G9 screens onto one of these Ergotron monitor arms just to reclaim all of that, like, wasted space beneath the screen. Now the Ergotron arms are also one of the only mounts that I've come across that can support the weight of these like huge ultra wide screens. Now the stand officially supports weight of up to I think it's 19 kilograms. This screen weighs 15.4 kilograms, but with this at least 57 inch G9, it definitely is pushing the limits of what it's capable of. Now I've had to tighten everything up that I can and everything works like, brilliantly, except that if I want to tilt the screen up or back, it doesn't really hold it there. It kind of sags back down again. Now that's not actually a problem for me because it actually sits in kind of the perfect position anyway. But if you want to perhaps have the screen a bit lower and like tilt it up, then it is going to struggle. Now I will link down below to the mount that I'm using now because you need the 
heavy duty version of the arm. And I'd also reached out to Ergotron who did confirm they're working on an updated version of their monitor arm that does support the weights. So once that does become available, I'm gonna update the link down below to send you to that one as well. Now I don't think they're gonna be developing a like a whole new arm because it's just the, the heavy duty tilt and pivot mount that needs updating. Over to connectivity now. Now we get a plethora of options, three HDMI 2.1 ports with one of them limited to 120 Hertz. You get a single display 2.1 port, two USB ports to let you use your screen as this USB hub and for firmware updates. And you also get a headphone port. Unfortunately, there is no USB-C, which is something I think you really should be getting when you're spending pretty significant amounts of cash on a screen like this. And whilst we are here, there is no separate power brick for the screen, it's just all built in. So there's just a three pin on the back with what our spritz called a kettle lead, since we all apparently like to drink a cup of tea or something over here. Now I have bought every single one of these Samsung G9 screens over the years with my own money. And even though I've spent thousands to buy them, even though thousands of people have graciously used my affiliate link down below to go and buy one for themselves, Samsung still refused to sponsor me or send out their screens for review, which, is a blessing in a way for you because at least I'm free to say whatever I want about their screens. But if there is just one thing you can do to help me make more videos like this for you, it will be to subscribe to the channel down below and also use the links that I'll have down below this video if you plan on buying one as well. Now it costs you absolutely nothing. It really helps support this channel and helps me to make more videos like these. Oh, and also I legit plan on keeping this monitor for like the foreseeable future. So if you have any questions, then I will respond. I'll try and respond to each and every question in the comments, which as the channel grows is kind of getting a bit challenging, but uh, yeah. I'll give it a shot. But one of the biggest reasons why I was looking forward to buying this screen is to finally, like finally get an increase in resolution over what we've seen on the previous 49 inch models. Now maxed out, this thing hits 7,680 by 2160, which is the equivalent of two separate 3840 by 2160 4K monitors side by side. Oh, and the 57 inch model is also at 140 pixels per inch compared to only 108 pixels on the 49 inch Neo. Now all of this combined, the additional screen space you get, the improved pixels per inch, is just incredible to experience. Now everything on my screen now looks really, really crisp, really sharp. And if I really wanna like pixel peep to try and see the individual pixels, then I have to get so close that I go cross-eyed before I do. But it is not just the incredible resolution. It is the fact that these screens can reach refresh rates of up to 240 Hertz. Now that makes these a great purchase for gamers, of course, and for general day-to-day -day use. The only problem though, is that even though Samsung has been producing these 240 Hertz screens for well, quite a few years now, the industry is still playing catch up. Now on my Mac, which is a $3,000 plus M1 Max Mac Studio, it only has HDMI 2.0, which then restricts what it can do. The best I can get on my M1 Max Max Studio, which isn't a mouthful at all, is the larger 5120 by 1440 resolution and up to 120 Hertz. And even to get that, I need to use a specific USB-C to DisplayPort cable, which I bought on Amazon, which when I ran into issues with like the previous generation G9 screens. So I'll link to that one down below as well. But to give Samsung credit at at least with that cable, the screen instantly works without any messing around with like custom display tools that I've had to tinker with before. It just sucks that I can't really hit the full resolution, but there is a workaround, which I'll get to in a moment. Now, for those of you with the M2 Max Studios, they do support 8K resolution and up to 240 Hertz. So you should be able to get the most out of this monitor, but I'm not going to chop in my perfectly good and very expensive M1 Max Studio just for an M2 version to test that out. Now my gaming PC, which has admittedly a very old 2080 card, which I am about to upgrade, doesn't support HDMI or DisplayPort 2.1. So it gets the full resolution, but only 120 Hertz unless I drop the resolution. Even a friend of mine who I reached out to on Twitter, who also bought the 57 inch G9, who also has a 4080 card, a much more kind of modern and update card, also doesn't support 2.1. So he still can't get the full resolution at 240 Hertz. Now it is only if you have a card that supports DisplayPort or HDMI 2.1. And for me, that is gonna wait until I build my next gaming rig with a 4090 graphics card. So if you are interested to see what this screen looks like with one of the world's fastest gaming PCs, then subscribe for when that comes out. Now I am not the kind of tech reviewer who does like in-depth stats and comparisons and benchmark tests. I'm sure there are reviews out there who already kind of compare all that color and contrast and comparison, and calibration and brightness and all that kind of stuff. So all I'm gonna go off is my actual experience of using this thing daily. And in terms of brightness, I know this is HDR1000 certified and Windows tells me that it should hit around a thousand nits peak brightness. But in terms of sustained brightness, the most I can get is around 600, 630 nits when I take Windows out of HDR mode. Now to me, all that means is that this screen honestly is plenty bright enough to use in even the brightest of environments. Again, I'm sitting next to a window, I've got bright lights behind me, it works just fine. The colors, they look 
great contrasty is that a word contrasty blacks are also okay now is it as good as an oled screen definitely not because oleds don't suffer from this like haloing effect where you can see here where the light bleeds around bright objects now the good news is that at least as a mini led screen with you know over 2000 some silly dimming zones that halo effect isn't as pronounced as it could be now i know this is predominantly a gaming monitor but we'll get to that in a moment but given the huge amount of comments and traffic that this channel generates every time i make a video about these like g9 ultra wide screens i know there is a huge percentage of you watching who are interested in how good this monitor is when it comes to general productivity day-to-day -day use that's like web browsing email music calendar stock traders all of the all of the good stuff well the good news is that this is nearly perfect when it comes to all of that it's just because of the extra resolution both in like vertical and horizontal axis i can just have way more apps open and visible on my screen at any one time than I could before. Now, in fact, this monitor has fixed the one thing I missed when I went from a 38-inch like screen all those years back to an ultra-wide 49-inch screen. And it's finally fixed here like four or five years later in this 57-inch G9 Neo, both on Windows and Mac. Now, Windows at least has some pretty decent controls for managing multiple windows. And for Mac, I use a tool called Moom, M-O-O-M, which allows me to like, position the windows in a certain place and then recall those positions with just a simple keyboard shortcut. So I can like, fire everything up in the morning and just hit one keyboard shortcut to have all of my windows snapped to where I want them to be. Now the great news with using a screen like this big and with both Mac and on Windows is that the menu bar, at least by default, is in the center of the screen where your like natural resting position is. So there's no hunting to the sides, left or right to find your menus. Now more good news is that unlike Samsung's recent G9 OLED, we get full picture in picture and picture by picture support. And you can use this to have two separate sources together. You can plug in an Xbox or a PlayStation and be playing games on one side whilst you have your PC open on the other side, perhaps streaming your game or running Discord or you know other social apps. And using picture by picture is actually how I've been able to solve my issue with my M1 Mac of being unable to display the full 7680 by 2160. Now, all I need to do is connect two cables from my Mac to the screen. So you've got one HDMI and one USB-C to display ports and then put my screen in this picture by picture mode. And now I have two separate screens, each of them running at 3840 by 2160. Now the only couple of downsides are that it kind of impacts the refresh rate. I get 120 Hertz on the DisplayPort side, but only 60 Hertz on the HDMI side due to like the max limitations. So that can cause some very weird issues if you're moving windows between the sides. And also if you watch a video with the window over the center part of the screen, then the colors can look a little bit off as well. But you can of course just move the video to one side and that fixes that problem. And for productivity use, honestly, 120 hertz is just fine. And even 60 is fine considering, you know, most of the time you're just staring at relatively like static images or watching videos, none of which really go anywhere above 60 FPS anyway. And you could say, well, why buy this monitor for productivity if you're not even gonna use the full like 240 hertz? Now for me, it is the 57 inch size, of course, the resolution and that 1000 R curve. They are all great reasons to buy the screen, even without being able to reach 240 hertz refresh rates. Now being able to have like multiple apps open and visible to you without having to constantly switch between apps like hunting for the right one and all on a single screen and not on two separate monitors which have this like bezel down the middle. Now this screen actually feels like you're getting three screens instead of two side by side because that center part of your field of view which would normally be taken up by the bezels of the two screens actually becomes usable and like a usable part of your desktop. So let's talk about gaming now because this is of course a gaming monitor and what an incredible experience it offers too. Now, now, first off, if you want to use your PS5 or your Xbox with the screen, then it will either stretch its way all across the screen or you'll get the black boxes just because games consoles aren't designed to work with these ultra wide resolutions. But again, if you were to run it in picture by picture mode with something else like a PC or Mac on the other side, then that works really, really well. Now, the good news is that this screen will future proof you to a certain extent, given that the current generation consoles can reach 120 hertz, but perhaps the like next generation consoles will be able to go for higher frames per second. But to get the most out of the screen, then you'll want to be playing on a PC. And with the limitations we've already mentioned around having support for HDMI or DisplayPort's latest standards, you'll get a great experience depending on the games that you play. Now with games such as Forza Horizon 5, being able to play on such a big and bright and just wide monitor like this is just so much fun. You've also got games such as, you know, Cyberpunk, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Overwatch, Fortnite, even Minecraft supports the ultra wide resolution and even GTA 5, which still looks great. Like, please let the GTA 6 rumors be true. So just to see if this 240 hertz 57 inch behemoth means that I play Fortnite any better, let's see how I get on whilst thanking today's sponsor, 1Password. Now, one of the issues that I and many people deal with is switching between devices, whether that's between Mac, Windows, iPhone or Android phones. Say for example if you're using Apple's keychain then you can't use it on an Android or Windows devices. So 1Password is something that I think everybody should be using as a family or even as a business and because my wife is absolutely awful at remembering passwords it's
it's a real lifesaver at times. Now, 1Password also has a unique approach to securing your account. Like you might think that it's a really bad idea to you know, put all of your passwords in one place. So instead of just using a master password, like most other password managers do, 1Password also generates a secret key, like locally on your device that not even 1Password themselves know. And that means that if someone else guesses your master password, your passwords are still virtually impossible to crack. It's also got a huge range of features, support for Apple Watch, Face ID, Windows Hello, and you can store and even share your logins, your passwords, credit cards, passports, and all sorts of information with only those people you want to have access. So please do check out the link below to get a 25% discount on either a personal or family subscription. And I'm not just saying this because they've sponsored this video, but consistently every single year, they come out on top in my like monstrous password comparison video where I test all of the most popular password managers. So, uh, so yeah, huge thank you. And uh, apparently it hasn't helped my Fortnite at all. Now, of course, the resolution and frames per second will ultimately come down to how good your gaming PC is. And with me, with a gaming PC that's certainly due an upgrade, my experience is, is fine, just as long as I lower the settings from game to game. Now, I was actually gonna run through a bunch of games and just tell you what settings I'm using and what frame rates I'm guessing, but honestly, they were so bad that it's really, really not worth talking about it. <laughs> we're talking like 30 frames per second or less in some games. So yeah, this video has been like a real big help in encouraging me to spend more money on a gaming PC. So whilst the 57 inch G9 Neo is most certainly the best gaming monitor and productivity monitor in the world right now, at least in my opinion, there are some problems that I wish Samsung would address. And considering this is now the fourth, or is it even the fifth iteration of the G9 screen by now, I would have kind of thought some of these would have been resolved. Now there's of course the LED core lighting on the back, which you can't even tell if it's on or not. It's just not bright enough to be worth using. And I've ended up just switching it off on all of my G9 screens. There is no USB-C and it would be great to get support for plugging in a Mac directly without faffing with you know adapters or docks or cables. Now the interface also represents a step back given that the G9 OLED was running the more modern Tizen OS, which then opens up things such as smart thing support and the ability to watch TV. And I'm kind of not a fan of that because it's quite a slow interface at times. But what I'm also not a fan of is installing firmware updates manually via USB in 2023. That was at least something that the Tizen OS power displays have got going for them. Like automatic and easy updates on their firmware. Now the screen can also get really quite hot at the top at times. I guess in the winter it helps you keep you warm but not quite what you want when it's 30 degrees outside or when shooting a long video like this. And what about the alternatives? Like why would you get one of these when you could pick up say a 55 inch Samsung Arc or the G9 OLED or even the 49 inch G9 Neo at significantly cheaper prices? Well, having used all of the Samsung G9 screens and the Samsung Arc, I can tell you without a doubt that this is better than all of them, even with those caveats. The Arc just felt ridiculously big because it just had a different aspect ratio. I much prefer the 32 by nine ratio of this 57 inch G9 Neo. And the Arc also failed to even run at 120 Hertz on my Apple devices. The latest G9 OLED, which you might've seen has been hiding under my desk for the whole of this video. It is great. It looks more modern than this, but it has a shallower curve when I much prefer the 1000 R curve that this and the other 49 inch G9 Neos have but I definitely prefer the extra vertical resolution and just the higher pixels per inch on this 57 inch version. So even though this is a damn expensive screen, in my eyes, it is also a damn good one. And one that is probably gonna sit on my desk, probably, I hope, because this is very expensive, for at least a year or until Samsung brings out their 2024 models. Perhaps there's gonna be an OLED version of the screen next year. But until then, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.